Canada, located in London, if I understand, I remember correctly, Canadian London. And the title is Mystery of Curvature in Non-Commutative Geometry, which I think is slightly different from this one which was announced, but I think it's fair. Thank you, yeah, I, I, I uh, change. Well, t thanks, uh, Ludwig. Okay, and please, thanks. please, please, master. Okay. Yeah. Okay. T thanks, uh, Ludwig, and thanks, Andre, for uh, for invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk here. Yeah, I changed the title because uh, I think it's the, the, this title is more reflective of the status of uh, of uh, this work. I mean, all, all these works that we are right now. I mean, in this stage of non-commutative geometry, there are a lot of things that remains to be um, to be known and uh, it's it's good to think about it like a mystery rather than a closed chapter or something okay so uh, let's see if i can move uh, okay so okay so let's uh, yeah I, by the way uh, everything i'm going to say more or less uh, it's uh, in this survey article I, I wrote with my student uh, Farzad Fatizadeh uh, a couple of years ago. So this is published in this book in honor of Alan, Alan Khan's 70th birthday. So uh, it's, it's a long uh, survey article with a lot of references and uh, it's uh, much more complete than what I'm able to achieve today. So uh, this is, uh, is, is a good uh, place to look up things. Okay, now, uh, as I said, I want to take a kind of broader point of view about uh, the, the status of curvature in non commutative geometry. And uh, I noticed that uh, the state that we are in is to some extent actually is comparable with the state that people were in 19th century. Uh, in 19th century, differential geometry uh, was developed uh, first by Gauss uh, in a limited scope, and then it in, in its full generality was developed by Riemann some 20 years, 30 years after Gauss, his teacher. Uh, so the problems that they had to deal with uh, these, uh, these uh, giants was, was no smaller than, 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 than our problems. I mean, they, they had to deal with a lot of, lot of issues and a lot of uh, mental barriers uh, had to be broken. And so they did, they did that uh, eventually, and uh, now we take it for granted. Uh, we take differential geometry uh, of curved spaces in n dimensions for granted. But this was not like that when, when they started. They didn't know anything. So, they, they, so I, I think it's very useful to, to read uh, the classics. So the two uh, most important papers, uh, of course, I mean, the first paper is uh, the paper of Riemann is a uh, habilitation lecture. And uh, when you read carefully, uh, all ideas of uh, modern mathematics, like abstract sets, space, manifold, Riemannian uh, metrics, sectional curvature, and eventually curvature tensor, Christopher symbols, idea of intrinsic geometry, dimensions, even uncountable dimensions, all of these ideas really were born uh, in, 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 in habilitation lecture of, uh, of Riemann of 1854. And the, the, there is one technical aspect that has to do with uh, Riemann curvature tensor. Uh, and this was done uh, in, in, in a kind of indirect way in a technical paper that he wrote. It's usually referred to as commentatio. This was uh, like seven years later, uh, 1861. Both papers were published, by the way, after Riemann's death. They were not uh, published uh, during his lifetime. He died, I think, in 1865. Uh, papers uh, both were published 1867 or 68, if uh, I'm not mistaken. So the second paper is about partial differential equations, really, is a heat conduction. There was a prize competition set by French Academy, and indirectly, there is an expression for curvature tensor in full generality in that paper. Uh, so that's uh, that's uh, the, the kind of source, but Riemann was, uh, of course, on the shoulders of Gauss, and as you know, I mean, uh, Gauss uh, wrote this famous text, uh, General Investigations of, on, on, on Closed Surfaces, uh, I'm sorry, on, on, on Surfaces, 1828. Uh, so, so in the paper, he introduced uh, some very important ideas that are still with us. These ideas are, are still with us. So for example, the Gauss map, this is kind of grandfather of Chen Bay theory. 
he maps uh, the, the tangent bundle into the tangent bundle of the sphere. And then he proves an amazing theorem, theorem I Gregium, which shows that the curvature, which was originally defined extrinsically by him for the first time, the Gauss curvature, is actually intrinsic. Uh, it can be defined explicitly uh, and only in terms of the curvature tensor. And then he also proved a local uh, gauss bonnet theorem, uh, which uh, shows that the, uh, the angular defect of any geodesic triangle, the difference between sums of angles and pi is uh, this thing that in Latin is called curvatura integra, total integral, integral of the curvature or total curvature, um, yeah, over the triangle. Importantly, also he proved in another paper earlier a, a result which is uh, which amounts to local uniformization theorem. Basically, it says that any two-dimensional Riemannian metric uh, is locally uh, conformally flat. Although, I mean, in his paper he he assumed he had to assume because his method was limited. Uh, to that case, uh, he had to assume that the coefficients of the metric are are analytic functions, uh, but but amazingly, he used complex analysis to prove this local uh, uniformization. And all these issues are amazingly with us today. I mean, we are kind of groping to understand versions of this in non commutative geometry, and we are gradually understanding. So I find it very, very interesting to, to, to make the comparison with, with, the, with the classics. So the uh, sectional curvature, for example, uh, in original paper of Riemann is defined uh, by uh, not, not, not in, in, I mean, uh, curvature tensor is not given in general form. I mean, it is, you go to a special coordinate system, which is essentially unique. You write the metric in that system, and then you introduce Riemann did CIJKLs or second derivatives of uh, metric coefficients in that coordinate system. And he realizes that this is an important quantity, four index quantity. And this is uh, this capture sectional curvature, which was originally defined in a different way by him. And then vice versa, sectional curvature also deter determines this. And so these are, uh, these are kind of blueprints uh, that was uh, set by uh, Riemann. And then uh, to uh, to kind of, uh, you know, develop these ideas, people had to develop uh, tensor analysis. There's no mention of tensor analysis in Riemann's work, of course, but it, somehow implicitly it is there. But then it, it, it took some people, like some, some great geometers like Ricci, Levici Vita, and the Italian school had to develop tensor, tensor analysis under the name of absolute differential calculus. This came about in, in, in uh, before 1900, and eventually there was a decisive text, a book that is still readable uh, today, and you can just learn tensor analysis if, if you care uh, from this text, uh, 1900 text of Ricci and Levici Vita. And then there was a Ricci curvature, because Riemann only defined uh, the full curvature tensor or full curvature that came about 1904, uh, which was. Uh, eventually played, uh, had to play a very, very important role in development of, uh, uh, of uh, general relativity by Einstein. So these are uh, just uh, results of pure mathematics, pure thinking about issues, uh, philosophical, mm -hmm. deep philosophical thinkings. And uh, this uh, eventually was uh, related to, uh, to physics. But uh, the relation to physics was already in, in the minds of Riemann and, uh, the greats like uh, Helmholtz, uh, I would say Klein and Gauss for sure, they had these relations. I mean, the, the, the original question was what is the nature of uh, geometry of space? Is Euclidean geometry, there is a typo there, sorry. Is Euclidean geometry really as Kant, uh, as Immanuel Kant taught is really an kind of a priori uh, knowledge uh, like logic or is it something that has to be understood by uh, experiment. This was not an easy question to tackle at all. I mean, uh, this was just a very deep philosophical question. And Riemann uh, really uh, showed the way. He argued that in, in his uh, lecture, he argued that actually the, um, 
the decisive thing to, to decide about the nature of a space, geometry of space is not infinitely large distances. That has to do maybe with topology, but the actual thing, because this idea of you know, light rays and solid bodies, I mean, about if the space is homogeneous or not, these things loses its pertinence in infinitely small uh, uh, kind of uh, distances, in very small distances. And what you have to look for is uh, the nature of forces that combines, uh, puts together the elements of the space. Uh, so he explicitly says that this sort of kind of elementary particles approach to, to a space time, the current things, already goes back to, to, to this uh, work of uh, Riemann. Of course, he didn't have elementary particle picture, but he was very conscientious about that. He said that uh, Newton uh, set, the, set the stage, but maybe Newton's thing is not enough. And we have to see what the experiment tells us. Okay, that's what I want to take. I mean, this is what I think is very, very important to, 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 to have this sort of what they did, what they were groping in, in 19th century in mind uh, in, in, in compared to what we have. So anyhow, so now uh, back to today, uh, after that, uh, philosophical historical digression. Uh, and so the object of worship for us, of course, is object of the day, so to speak, is care of non commutative torus. Uh, this uh, see, this uh, rock or whatever is the closest thing to a curved uh, torus I could find in nature. So this is this appears in, in, in the in, in the article, by the way. So um, this is a curved uh, uh, commutative torus, but we can imagine curved non commutative torus is something like this. And uh, of course, it's, uh, there is a spectral triple uh, on this uh, non commutative uh, torus, AHD, as uh, been discussed extensively yesterday. So the question is if you have this idea of metric Dirac operator, how can you define uh, curvature? So classically, there are two approaches to, to, to define curvature. There is one algebraic approach, which eventually came out of Riemann's geometric approach. It was made completely algebraic, like a machine, uh, thanks to the Italian school of tensor analysis. It became completely algebraic. And then uh, under the influence of spectral geometry, eventually an analytic approach was also achieved. This was uh, the uh, heat trace expansion and heat kernel expansions, these uh, things. Uh, and amazingly, the two approaches uh, give you the same result as far as the scalar curvature goes and as far as Ricci curvature goes. But the full uh, Riemann curvature tensor, I'm not sure we can reach it uh, through, uh, spect through a spectral methods. And that's one of the mysteries that uh, right now we, we have to deal with, I mean, how, is there any analog of Riemann curvature, full curvature tensor in non commutative geometry or not? If you want to think about the problem, I think that's a, that's a very interesting problem. Maybe there isn't, maybe there shouldn't be. I mean, we don't know, that's a mystery. Okay, now uh, about curvature. So there is a disambiguation I should make. Uh, already in 1980, 81, Alain uh, had this paper, this foundational paper, the Comte Rendu note, as you know, uh, five, six pages. And he set the foundations for a non commutative churn weight theory in that paper. So that's, uh, that works. It's uh, algebraic, it works in the non commutative uh, setting to a, to a large extent, churn weight theory. Of course, we cannot define chair classes, but churn characters and a lot of things work. And this is a beginning of a uh, line, line of investigations that's still very active today. That's the algebraic approach to connection and curvature and uh, these things. Um, it's been really flourished uh, over time, uh, but then the relation between this analytic approach and this algebraic approach, again, is another mystery that uh, we don't know. Uh, even a scalar curvature you define by using uh, these algebraic methods and scalar the curvature that Alain defined and we defined uh, using analytic methods. Is there any relation between the two? It's not known. Um, most probably there isn't any relation, but this is again very strange because classically they are related. They are the same. 
Okay, so uh, this was discussed also yesterday. The Laplace type operators we, we consider, uh, these are, uh, well, the leading part is uh, completely defined by the metric. It's a scalar. There, there's nothing uh, strange about the leading part and there is lower order terms. Uh, this has uh, many examples, Laplacian on forms, for example, is like that, Dirac Laplacian, uh, you, can, you can work uh, with, it comes into that category, and uh, these, are, um, these are good examples of Laplace type operators. The interest for Laplace type operators, the interest in Laplace type operators, I should say, is because they uh, lend themselves to very nice uh, analytic treatment. There is a very nice asymptotic expansion of the heat kernel as it was again discussed very well yesterday. So, uh, but I mean this page, uh, so lemma is that yes, you can uh, write uh, this Laplace type operator, always write it as uh, this in terms of connection Laplacian, uh, Nabla star Nabla, it can be called also Buckner Laplacian in special case Buckner dealt with and there is this endomorphism part E, which uh, you can drive it from the uh, Laplace operator to this recipe. So there's a unique decomposition like that. And once you have this E, once you have this uh, connection Laplace, you, you, you can read of the formulas of Gilkey and others. So the, for the Dirac operator, a uh, special case of the Dirac operator, uh, the, 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 the uh, E is really uh, just a uh, scalar, uh, scalar curvature uh, operator. So it's a scalar curvature. That's a well-known, uh, one of these uh, Nishnerovich uh, classic formulas. So heat kernel asymptotics again. Uh, so the, the operator, uh, the heat operator uh, for such operators, so such P's is the smoothing operator with a smooth kernel. And there is an asymptotic expansion. Indeed, it is an asymptotic expansion only. Um, I mean, uh, the, the right-hand side doesn't have to be convergent uh, for any T, uh, but uh, still extremely useful uh, thing because it's asymptotic expansions of, when they are useful, they are far more useful than uh, Taylor expansions. And these coefficients AIs uh, that appear there, now my notation is, I use A0, A1, A2, sometimes, the, double index notation is used twice of this thing. So there's some confusion here, I'm sorry. But uh, these coefficients are being calculated uh, starting with, uh, I believe uh, McKean and Singer, they, they calculated for the Laplace in the first two terms, uh, they, they got the scalar curvature and uh, things. And then in general, Gilkey has gone up to six terms, I believe, uh, or maybe eight, I'm not sure. Um, in special cases, people can go much higher, uh, but they lose uh, their meaning really when you go uh, when you go much higher. I mean, uh, so the first term is very important while term. Uh, uh, it's easy, but it's extremely important because it gives you while asymptotics of eigenvalues using uh, tau variant theorems. The second term is the scalar curvature essentially, and then there is this e. Starting from four term, it, it gets it gets complicated, um, but it's still um, still within reach. But then uh, you see this a six, for example. Now I'm using different notations here, but I mean it doesn't matter because I'm not using it. It they, they, they become uh, out of reach. I mean I mean for example, it's not clear how one can. I mean these are covariant derivatives of curvature tensor uh, essentially, but it's not clear how you can read the curvature tensor itself from this, uh, this uh, jungle of uh, formulas. And of course, uh, one importance of these at least low order uh, calculations uh, of heat, heat, heat kernel is uh, the work of Ali and Alain Shamsuddin Khan, a spectral action principle. It was also discussed yesterday. And uh, yeah, they're yeah, using using these uh, Gilkey uh, terms. Uh, you can you can relate uh, the um, the uh, spectral action uh, to uh, basic uh, actions of uh, uh, classical physics uh, and, and also and also quantum physics. Uh, Einstein-Hilbert action, Yang-Mills action. Uh, these are all can be obtained from that. 
So now how, how uh, in, in, in reality, how we can approach, uh, for example, a scalar curvature, well, one approach is to form the scalar, uh, to, to, to form, for example, the um, spectral zeta function, where lambda i's are non-zero eigenvalues of the Laplacian, the scalar Laplacian of functions, you form this. Uh, this is always thanks to basic estimates. Uh, this is a holomorphic function on real part of S bigger than uh, dimension over two. And uh, it can be uh, uh, meromorphically extended. Uh, the location of poles, uh, or possible location of poles, is completely known. Uh, you can you can you can uh, write uh, where they should be. The top pole is always a pole m over two, uh, and uh, yeah. So depending on dimension being even or odd, there is some structure in the poles, but. Uh, Zero uh, for because we are dealing with closed manifolds and there are no uh, corners, singularities, anything. Uh, zero is always a uh, regular uh, point. So um, yes, uh, one can uh, in fact uh, look at the values of the function at zero, value of the derivative of this zeta function at zero, and residues of the zeta function. And they involve uh, geometric informations. For example, uh, the two cases that are interesting, have been interesting for us from beginning is uh, residue at subleading pole uh, that captures a scalar curvature. So my notation for a scalar curvature is now S of X uh, through this functional uh, that's defined on for any F, this, this result holds for any, any smooth F on, on this localized data function, so to speak. So this essentially defines a scalar curvature. And second one, there is a correction term, uh, and then this uh, is uh, in dimension two that we started with. Everything started in dimension two. The, um, the value of the zeta function, spectral zeta function at zero, basically determines the scalar curvature. So that's one approach to define, uh, to define these quantities. Of course, it was originally used by Ray Singer in the in classic paper to define uh, regularized determinants as log that. I mean, this is also very, very useful in another context, but not here right now. So now the search for curvature in this sense, in the sense of Riemannian geometry, in the sense of, um, uh, how to say, in, yeah, I mean, you have this because in, in, in NCG, in non complete geometry, the metric is given by this Dirac operator. So you want to define curvature in terms of the metric, which is Dirac operator. So this is kind of Riemannian approach, if you want, original Riemannian approach to curvature. The search already started by uh, Alan, Alan Kahn and uh, Paulo Cohen in, in late 1980s, there is also a preprint, MPI preprint. Uh, which they did not publish because, uh, I mean, in that paper, they were trying to prove uh, uh, gauss bonnet theorem, uh, but uh, it was not, uh, they were not happy. It was not, they couldn't simplify it. I mean, basically the, the expression. At the end, it was kind of left open because it was not clear because whether these terms cancel or do not cancel, whether gauss bonnet holds or not. So this was a, already a mystery that uh, had to be faced by, uh, by, by Alan. And, uh, and then eventually he, he came along and, and finished the job. Uh, so let me explain. So uh, of course, non-commutative torus, I don't have to define for this uh, audience, you know, and these basic derivations and basic trace, just uh, standard, uh, I just defined the, um, the, uh, the notation. For you here. Um, now, um, it's important to think about complex structures uh, because uh, what the operator that they took and we took later is really a Dolbo operator. Uh, I mean, it's like half of the, I mean, and then the Laplacian is um, Dolbo Laplacian, really, is like half of the actual Laplacian. I mean, later on, we took full Laplacian also, but it's half. And classically, uh, any two-dimensional uh, surface, uh, I mean, complex, uh, complex, I mean, complex curve 
is a KLR manifold, and we know that Dolbo Laplacian is related to uh, just the usual Laplacian, it's like half of it or something, uh, because of KLR identities. And uh, so uh, this was a kind of uh, good choice to, to choose, but you don't have to choose that. You can, in non cutting geometry, we don't know uh, actually what's the status of uh, KLR geometry. In, in this analytic setting, in this uh, heat, heat equation approach setting, and what is the relation between these, these operators in general. So anyhow, so the uh, Dolbo operator is uh, chosen uh, by choosing a parameter in the upper half plane as in the classical case. Uh, and uh, so you define the space of uh, one zero forms. Uh, again, it's like H zero, but uh, completed with respect uh, to that to that metric. Um, one me. open, yes, yes. May I ask a question. Yes, yes. Yes, I, I was always uh, wondering uh, this construction of this L two space is in fact a GNS construction for a for a trace. Yes, okay. yes, yes. Famous GNS construction, and if you take a bicommutant of this algebra acting on this Hilbert space. Is it true that you will get a type two one factor or not? Uh, for this one? Yes, uh, it, for me it's not clear since, okay, this, uh, this scalar product is given in terms of trace, but uh, in the von Neumann setting, you require your trace to be, uh, to be normal. So I don't know whether there are so, some problems with extension of this. No, but I mean, that's right. But we are not looking at the von Neumann completions. We are always at the level of uh, smooth, uh, dense subalgebra. Yes, 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 yes. I, I know that we are not interested in, but, but nevertheless, I always find it uh, not clear. Oh. It is known or? Oh. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as, as a general question, I don't know the answer. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah, but it's not, uh, it's not, doesn't have any, bearing on this right now. But as a general question, yeah, it's interesting to know, yes. yes but, but you agree that this is not clear that we'll get type two one, yes? Well, uh, I mean, for a theta, if you take it uh, in its, uh, I don't know. I don't know what you get, it, not to me, yeah. but I think I, I'm pretty sure it is known. It's completely known. And right now I cannot commit myself to an answer right now, sorry. Okay, okay. okay. So well, that's a good question, thank you, yeah. I think for for the canonical trace, it is. Um, well, okay, so I, I don't know. I mean, I, I was thinking of type two infinity, but that's okay. Yeah, but we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we can discuss it later. So okay. uh, now the flat Laplacian, of course, if you don't do uh, anything, if you don't introduce any conformal structure, you, you always have this flat Laplacian. I mean, I mean, conformal perturbation, genuine conformal perturbations of the metric of course, a flat Laplacian. So the flat Dolbo Laplacian, I should say, is this uh, operator del star. You can compute uh, del star turns out to be indeed delta one plus tau bar delta two. And this uh, flat uh, Dolbo is uh, this operator, uh, which you see here. Uh, so tau is this uh, uniformization parameter in the upper half plane. Again, another thing we don't know if uniformization theorem, even local uniformization theorem is in what sense it's true in non-commutative geometry for, for surfaces. Um, interesting question is open. So when then uh, the idea that was introduced oh, by- Sorry, uh, Masoud, yeah, sorry. Could you repeat what, what you have said, just said? About, about what? Uniformization? Uh... Yes, I mean, this, you know, the, I, I mentioned this result of Gauss. He showed yeah. that uh, any Riemannian, uh, two dimensional Riemannian metric is actually, um, I mean, is conformally equivalent to, a, I mean, there is, a, there is a coordinate system. In that coordinate, it becomes like e to the h dx squared plus dy squared. Okay. Okay, or uh, I mean, if you introduce uh, this tau, I mean, basically there is uh, this e to the h, this term over, over there, this uh, flat uh, Laplacian. But what is the analog of this in, in our case? Because uh, I mean, we took, a, we, we took an operator, so let me show you here. We took, the, I mean, uh, Alan took this operator, I mean, uh, and, then, uh, and then we are working with it, this is good. 
but how how do we know this is the most general uh, case? I mean, I mean, would be good to know something along those lines. Uh, you, you know, I mean. Okay, I get the point. Yeah, good. Yeah, for example, what are all possible complex structures on, on even on the on the non-commutative two torus? I mean, this is interesting. Or even on 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 a sphere, that's also interesting. Anyhow. So this uh, conformal perturbations of the metric, uh, it was introduced. Uh, it's, it's a natural uh, thing to do. You just uh, change your uh, trace uh, to a, a non-tracial state by introducing this conformal parameter. It is a KMS state. Uh, the modular group is uh, sigma t. It's, it's, it's a trivial modular group is by inner conjugations like this. And the modular automorphism now for notations uh, is important, uh, is uh, capital delta, unfortunately, but that's what it is. It's just uh, conjugation by e to the h. Uh, there's no complex parameter, of course, in this case. So that's uh, So the uh, spectral triple that was introduced um, in the original paper is, I can write it like this, uh, the d is, uh, this odd operator is del phi and del phi star is really the adjoint. I mean, this del phi star is the adjoint that you don't have any choice. You have to compute the adjoint of del phi. Once you change the metric on, on, on H, on, on, on the domain, is, domain Hilbert space H phi, you don't change the metric on H10, but we change the metric on H phi. So the, the adjoint has to be computed according to that new metric. And then the full perturb Laplacian is uh, this operator uh, that obviously you get. Uh, then, uh, okay, so then the question, uh, the question is now, uh, now the, the, the thing is cast, you see that, so we have to deal with the beast now. So the question is, can you show, for example, uh, that um, zeta zero plus one is actually zero or not? As it's dictated by uh, by this uh, by the by, by the scalar curvature uh, formula. The, the Gauss Bonnet for non commutative torus in this case uh, really it means that for any uh, conformal perturbation of the metric, uh, this quantity is always zero. The quantity uh, comes out to be. Um, in the original paper comes, comes, came out to be the sum of two terms. Uh, but when we looked at the question for general tau, uh, just, uh, yeah, just immediately after, um, there, there, there were like four terms, four terms and it had to be a cancellation. So the cancellation eventually was proved by uh, Conan and Tretkov in 2009. So I was very lucky, uh, Alan explained this problem to me and I immediately thought, uh, okay, so there is something we can do perhaps after, I mean, I left over Wolf. I thought something we can do because there is this general complex parameter. And when you look at the general case, some new things appear and it worked. Mm -hmm. So it was a, a really piece of luck and a lot of uh, help from Alan, of course. So, uh, so this was uh, set then, this was settled like that. Uh, so this is, this is a good indication that, uh, I mean, these operators are extremely difficult to, de to deal with. I mean, there, there are a lot of tricks. I mean, this is a kind of anti-unitary equivalence between this operator is kind of very, very difficult operator, the, the original one, but this one, is anti-unitary equivalent to this is K. The K is this e to the h operator, and this is flat uh, Dolbo. And so the spectral analysis of the right-hand side is much more, um, is, I would say is easier, but I mean, the computations are not easy anyhow. So, uh, so that's, uh, uh, that's what uh, it had to be done. And certainly without, without computers, uh, I mean, there was almost no hope of, for both cases, almost no hope of uh, getting it done. I mean, it's very, very important uh, to also check uh, the, the results uh, using different computer programs. So then the search, the natural search was to look for scalar curvature uh, for the first time in, uh, so the scalar curvature 
Uh, again, uh, you can just say it is given in this picture, I'm using zeta function, uh, spectral zeta function picture, but you can also use it uh, by Malin transform. You can, you can cast it in the language of uh, coefficients of heat kernels as you know, been discussed. In one way or the other, it's, uh, it's set uh, like this. It's completely fixed by this equation. Uh, so now this is much more complicated question. What, what sort of uh, expression or element of a smooth non commutative torus could, uh, could that be? So computing that um, was uh, much more difficult, as I said, uh, but then it was done. Um, by uh, two groups. Um, uh, maybe before I give the result, I should say that uh, the crucial thing was, uh, of course, using Alan to the differential calculus for non commutative tori. This was done in 1981. It's already in that short uh, paper. Uh, the elements of it, I believe, is there. And also in the book, uh, in, in 94 book, uh, Alan develops this uh, quite a bit. So. Um, these are there, and uh, this had to be used for the first time in a serious way. So really, you have to get uh, your hands uh, uh, kind of dirty and go to computer work and a lot of intriguing algebraic manipulations. The final form for the curvature, uh, it's not so bad. I mean, it's really like, um, if you compare to classical formulas, which by the way are due to Gauss, uh, Gauss has a formula in his paper, which is like, if the metric is e to the h, a flat metric, then the, there is an expression for Gauss curvature, which involves Laplacian. So there is uh, some uh, resemblance to that. This delta zero, not bold, this uh, triangle zero is, is really Laplacian, is the flat Laplacian, appears there. But then uh, there are these, uh, there are these extra terms, uh, like there, there is this function of two variables, uh, which you have to substitute this uh, log of the uh, modular operator into them. And there's also a function of uh, W function. There is function of one variable. So these are explicitly calculated functions, which, uh, which uh, gives you a explicit uh, form for the scalar curvature. So these functions, the calculated R1 is uh, in terms of sine hyperbolic, uh, sine hyperbolic squared, R2. I mean, these are all like um, basically uh, in terms of some uh, hyperbolic uh, sine and cosine functions. Um, mm -hmm. The, the second function like R2, um, as well as the first one, all these functions are analytic. I mean, by the way, I mean, for example, it's not clear that R2 is analytic because it's, it's a quotient of two, uh, two functions like that. And sine can be zero, I mean, but they cancel. Uh, there, there is no singularity in R2. There is no singularity in W, also R1. These are, these are analytic functions of two variables and one variables. So, Functional calculus can be applied to them without any problem. And uh, once you sub in S and T or X by the modular operator, you get expressions for, uh, for, the, for, for your scalar curvature, uh, which is an element of the non-commutative uh, two terms, the smooth non-commutative two terms. Then we looked at, uh, of course, a lot of things, uh, you know, then uh, it's kind of the doors open and you can, you can try different things. But one of the things is that uh, because of the nature of calculations is such that you cannot uh, write down general, you could not, I should say, write down general formulas as in classical differential geometry. In classical differential geometry, you have a tensor and you can, you can define this for any n. You can define curvature things for any n. But we could not, I mean, you can define it here, but we could not compute it for any n in this case. And the reason is that we, we had to use, uh, I mean, uh, computer. I mean, you, for computer, you cannot say do this for any n. I mean, it's impossible. It was, it was at least impossible to do it. So a case by case analysis was very, very important. And uh, so we looked at the um, three torus, four torus, 
uh, and in these works, uh, always with um, with respect to conformal perturbations. But then uh, recently, we also looked at uh, non-conformal perturbations uh, of, of the metric. So it's like there is a there is a like a diagonal perturbation e to the h1, e to the h2, for example, uh, e to the h3 could be, but now H1, H2, H3 are, are, are not arbitrary elements. They are, they are not the same, but they are not arbitrary elements of it. There is some restriction on them. They are all functions of one, uh, op, one operator, one element of the matrix uh, of, of the non conflict torus. Anyhow, so, but uh, explicitly in the case of uh, four torus and uh, conformal perturbations, which is much easier, uh, we uh, also we, we we calculated the scalar curvature. Uh, so I mean, it's kind of not essential really now at this stage to use complex structure on t theta four, but uh, we had other ideas in mind back then. So we introduced complex structure no matter what, but it's not essential. Uh, so then we we we, I mean, you you play same game more or less. Uh, and then, um, then what happened? Of course, you have the trace, and you have this uh, non-tracial uh, state, and you have this modular operator, and this. Uh, so the perturbed Laplacian. Uh, now you see this is a, a full uh, perturbed Laplacian. This is not del bar star, uh, or del star del. This is d star d. So this is a full perturbed uh, Laplacian, or, or yeah. So uh, yes, if h is equal to zero, this is really the Laplacian on the flat torus. If not, uh, that's a, that's an operator you have to deal with. Then, uh, okay, so then you have to compute uh, the perturbed Laplacian, which you can compute. That's not difficult, really. I mean, if you know what you're doing, you, 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 can, you, can, you can compute this. That's not the point. Or writing down this Laplacian like that, this is not the point. I mean, uh, this is uh, quite a straightforward. A uh, little bit about uh, constant differential calculus at this stage, maybe it's already, I mentioned it, maybe I should pass. Uh, the, the symbols, um, these are smooth maps from uh, R4 in this case to non commutative smooth non commutative torus. Uh, these are the uh, symbols and to such things you can define, uh, you can attach a pseudo differential operator of, of the right order. And uh, there is a product formula, which is mimics in some sense, the, the classic formula. And there is, uh, you, can, you can start working with uh, resolvents uh, in this. So we always co com compute the resolvent and resolvent expansion. And uh, yeah, this is the formula, by the way, for the, for the product. And you can just, uh, you can just, uh, carry the computations like that. Uh, but again, because of non-commutativity, there are many, many new features you have to deal with. So this is much more um, complicated, as I said. So the symbol of this operator, for example, uh, again, that's, you, you compute the symbol. That's, that's not difficult. You just compute the symbol. And once, uh, once you know the symbol, it's a second order operator. Once you know the symbol, then you can start inverting uh, the thing, uh, compute the, um, the heat operator using uh, Cauchy integral formula for, 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 for operators like that. So B lambda is the, uh, is the inverse of, uh, is the asymptotic inverse, so to speak of delta phi minus lambda. There is an expansion uh, for the for the symbol of B lambda, and the, the gain is to find B zero, B one, B two, and basically B two. In our case, the gain is to, to compute B two. Okay, so the the scalar curve is already defined. I don't have uh, to do this uh, now. The, the point is that you get a formula in this case also which is a bit like uh, the, the original uh, formula in the, in the two-dimensional case, 
maybe a bit simpler, maybe a bit simpler. I mean, I, I don't know why that's the case. Is it because um, the, the, the moduli of this metrics that we are dealing with in the four dimensional case is much more restricted now. I mean, metrics that are of the, four, of the conformally uh, flat is much rare in four dimensions than uh, two dimensions. Is it because of that or for some other reason, the formula tends to be, uh, tends to kind of become a little more uh, easier to, to, to handle. The functions are, and uh, I mean, sorry, the function the H and K, the one variable function, two variable functions, again, are computed. And at least in this, I mean, this maybe this also could be written in terms of uh, uh, hyperbolic sine and cosine functions, Perhaps it can by change of variable, but I don't pursue that. But in this picture, anyhow, the, the function h again is analytic and you can just uh, write uh, uh, expansion uh, of this, uh, Taylor expansion of this function. Uh, just uh, like that, this is a picture of the function. And RST, oh yes, RST uh, R2 is, uh, is, is an analytic function. Again, this is the graph of R2. So, uh, so this is for the, two variable function for t theta two. I don't know why it's here. Uh, here I had uh, h and k. So maybe it belongs to somewhere else. Okay, now, uh, because you have a scalar curvature and you are in dimension four, we wanted to play uh, the game of, um, you know, uh, Einstein-Hilbert action. So you look at the Einstein-Hilbert action, which is phi zero of R really, just integral of R is just phi zero of R. And you want to find the minimizers of this. So Einstein-Hilbert action, you can compute. Uh, that's, uh, that, that's computed in our paper with Farzad. And uh, we notice that for any wild factor, this is always less than or equal to zero. And uh, so the, the critical points is just at, I mean, the maximum is just at h equal to zero. I mean, I cannot say the critical points for all values. I mean, just maximum is really zero. And that happens for h constant. So um, this sort of prompted me to look at maybe analog of uh, Ricci curvature in, in, in the case of non complete geometry, because this equation, the, the variational equation for scalar curvature is really, uh, it, it can be written as Ricci flat condition because there is no, there is no mass, there is no uh, energy momentum tensor. So it should be Ricci flat. So what is Ricci in this case? So this was done uh, later the analog of reaching are in this spectral picture. Uh, so this was also very interesting. I mean, uh, there is a formula. I mean, one day by chance, I just opened this uh, collected works of Michael Atia, I think volume six or seven, my God, uh, something like that. And then I opened this page and there was this formula, it just Atia writes Hodge minus Buckner is equal to Ricci. And then he, he does it, uh, I think, for something else. I'm not sure exactly what, right? I don't remember. But then I thought that, okay, this could be very useful for, uh, for <laughs> to define maybe reaching our sense because left-hand side, we can make sense of it spectrally. It turned out uh, in, in the paper with Asgard that this can be done indeed. And Asgard had already started thinking about it himself. So it was a very lucky situation. So in this case, what you have to do Oh, this is an awkward notation, sorry, L2 of, uh, you know, this is really L2 form forms. So this is really Laplacian on forms. So just uh, on one forms, that's all I need. Uh, you, can, you can look at Laplacian on one forms. And um, okay, so if you look at Laplacian on one forms, and then there is a um, the Ricci operator uh, actually pops out. I mean, if you, this is a Laplace type operator, uh, not, not, not the scalars on one forms, this is Laplace type operator, then, then, then the E, the, the, that endomorphism operator, turns out to be uh, actually the Ricci operator, essentially Clifford multiplication by these uh, two components, and then there is this uh, Ricci operator. 
So this gives an opening because you, if you can do a spectral analysis on this one, on, on, on this uh, hodge Durham spectral triple, uh, this is the most uh, kind of basic spectral triple. You don't need even Dirac operator or anything to, to define this. This is just most straightforward spectral triple that's at your disposal in a non commutative geometry. So if you take that, then uh, you just have to work with one forms. Then uh, there is a definition. There's a, there's a possibility of definitions. Okay, now the, the, the terms, uh, like uh, now you have to deal with two things, uh, La, Laplacian on uh, scalar Laplacians on delta zero and uh, one form Laplacian delta one. These uh, coefficients, uh, you look at uh, Gilkey's formulas, can be can be can be read from Gilkey's formula. I mean, of course, for delta zero is always a scalar curvature a two, but for the for uh, delta one, for one form Laplacian a two is a mixture of scalar curvature and Ricci curvature. So what you have to do then is to separate these two things because. Uh, uh, you don't want to mix them because then you're, you're not able to extract uh, Ricci. So in, in our picture, in, in this non commutative picture, Ricci really becomes a, an, an operator uh, on one forms, as I said. But what you need, uh, what you need is, is a setting uh, in this uh, non commutative setting. You need a little more kind of flesh in, in, in this. So you, you need a kind of, you have to say there is a differential graded algebra that kind of plays the role of this uh, one forms. And it, it, could be, it could be anything very general. And then you can, you can, you can define the Ricci curvature by through this Ricci functional. Also the, the title of this conference I noticed is also uh, spectral functional. So here is, here is another spectral functional, which is the Ricci functional. So this uh, for an endomorphism of the, uh, it's convenient to work with cotangent bundle instead of tangent bundle, one form. For an endomorphism of this cotangent bundle, a smooth section, the, the Ricci functional is defined like that. It's defined by taking a two term and, uh, of uh, Laplacian on, 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 on scalar Laplacians or Laplacian on one forms. Of course, I mean, F is good for the second one, but then for you have to, to take trace. I mean, that's uh, there is a yeah, this, this applying trace to F in this case is important because it gets rid of, uh, it, it kind of untangles the, two, the two, two things. And then the localized version of this spectral zeta function, uh, as usual, you can define it. You have to subtract the zero modes, you subtract it. And then the Ricci functional uh, came out uh, to be is expressible in terms of res residues uh, in dimension bigger than two and in dimension two, uh, it's uh, in terms of values. And uh, you have to subtract or add the contributions from uh, zero modes on, uh, on the scalars and one forms. So me, could you repeat what is Q here? Oh, Q is the projection into zero modes. Okay. Yeah, you have to subtract that. Otherwise, uh, otherwise, uh, yeah. I mean, it's like uh, the case of uh, Tutorus original case. So again, we played this game for uh, for non-commutative uh, Tutorus first, and then we did it for non-commutative Tutorus just to see uh, just to see what happens. Um, so, well, I mean, the calculations are kind of longer in this case, but uh, it can be done. I mean, th this is a terminology that uh, it was introduced in uh, Khan Moscovici paper. I mean, uh, this is a, it's called, we called it modular Durham spectral triple, but it really means that a spectral triple that uh, you get by using this uh, new uh, conformally perturbed uh, metric. That's, uh, that's all. Uh, the, the difficulty is computing the adjoints uh, and going through, the, through all the steps. So I don't want to uh, 
uh, spend more time in this. But then indeed with Asker and, uh, and Roman, uh, the, the, the computation was done. So the, the Ricci operator, this is, uh, this is an operator now. The Ricci operator, uh, it, so this is like, you have to see it as an inflation, okay? So it's like a two by two matrix uh, because it's, it's a matrix of uh, operators. But uh, what is quite interesting is that, the, again, uh, the old functions kind of pop up here. I mean, this function R and S are exactly the same functions that uh, we had with Farzan and also Alan and Henry also got in, in, the, in their works. So somehow uh, these functions are kind of universal functions. They, they appear in all these calculations. I should say, Analogs of this function. So now I'm not talking about this uh, work, uh, this new work with 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 Asker we, we did after these things. Uh, I mean, these new functions, these functions also appear in in very general case because now we can do n-dimensional case for class of metrics that are more general than 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 conformally applied. That's that's my paper uh, in my paper with Asker uh, that was posted two years ago, more than two years ago. So uh, there is something very universal about these functions, but it has to be understood. What is it that, uh, I mean, uh, what is it uh, that uh, we look? I mean, here we just check that the commutative limit uh, works. It corresponds to uh, the Ricci curvature. I mean, this is all two dimensions. So the Ricci curvature essentially is, is a multiple of a scalar curvature. So there is nothing. And these are formulas for a scalar curvature due to Gauss, as I said. In, the, in, in two dimension. So you just check that uh, this works. <laughs> now, I think I want to um, finish with uh, the, my, my, my original thing that I started. I think uh, in a way this is important. I mean, what remains to be done? I mean, the point is that we are really just at the beginning of the road. I mean, uh, what we need to do is to find, I mean, for example, what is the full, as I said before, what is the full Riemann curvature tensor? Does it make sense to search for that or not? It's not known. What is wild curvature in non quantum geometry? Higher dimensional gauss bonnet theorem, for example. You see the gauss bonnet density in four dimensions, we don't have any analog of that. That's also related to lack of, uh, uh, full curvature tensor in this case, but maybe there is another formulation. Uh, it could be useful. What is uniformization theorem? These things I, I discussed. So we need more examples, much more examples, many more examples and uh, more concepts at the same time. Also, the formalism is really just for int integral dimensions, uh, spectral tuples with integer, uh, you know, a metric dimension. I mean, absolutely, as you know, of course. But uh, what about fractals? Uh, people in, in fractal theory, can they, can they have analogs of uh, curvature for, for fractals? And they have analogs of like uh, synthetic curvatures, uh, Ricci curvature, for example, there is this whole, uh, humongous book by Villani, which we discusses these things uh, in the context of, uh, I mean, uh, transport theory and uh, uh, optimal transport and uh, yeah. So, and we should also think of uh, what people do in, 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 in like uh, arithmetic differential geometry, they define curvature for uh, this sort of very, very general they look very discrete, finite arithmetic objects uh, over finite fields or varieties over finite fields, these sort of things. The whole differential geometry, uh, they, they, they extend or they, they try to extend. So we should think about these things uh, in, in, I mean, these are all missing really right now. I mean, this is not a pessimistic message. This is, uh, this is a very, very optimistic message, by the way. I mean, we, we, we want to really, uh, uh, push ahead, but these are sort of uh, questions that we have to uh, deal with. So thank you very much. I stop here now. Thank you very much, Masoud. Perfect in time. However, we don't have much time.